Good morning, everyone. How are you? Pretty rough morning, I see. All right. Everybody doing well? Good to see you all fill in the house. It's great to have you here. And as has been mentioned, if you're a guest, we're always glad you're here. We welcome you and have a gift for you afterwards. Want to say hi. Uh, a couple of quick reminders. I appreciate what Nathan said. There's a lot going on. And, you know, certain times of the church year, there just seems like a lot. And that's what's going on now with Easter upon us. I uh, just want to remind you this meeting after church for Israel. If you're interested in that, you don't know enough, or you're not sure, you have questions, that's what it's for. So it's for you. Come and hang out with us. It won't be long. We'll give you the, give you the whole thing. Um, also, next week, uh, you, you've heard about this Seder thing. I just want to make sure you guys are aware. It, sometimes it's called a Seder meal. So when you, when you hear the word meal, what are you hoping for? You're hoping for volume. Yeah. It's not a meal, okay? So don't come hungry and make sure you have plans afterward to go eat. It's called a Seder meal because it, it, it picks up from the Passover that we study about in the Old Testament and it helps us see the work of Christ in all the types and symbolism. So you'll sit at a table, which is why we need you to sign up because there's a place setting for you. So don't just pop in because that's gonna be awkward, you sitting over there uh, in that section. So you'll, you'll sit at a table with others. There'll be a place setting for you. And I'll teach you through some of the parts of the Seder meal. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to taste them if you want. You don't have to. Um, that's a clue as to what I will not be doing. So there's some stuff that's there and it's good, but it's, this isn't like a, a, a meal, okay? Everybody good with that? All right, just want to make sure you're not coming and like leaving with an attitude because you thought there was going to be ribs. No ribs. Uh, it's a Seder, uh, so it'll be teaching. Four o'clock, we'll have you out of here in time to go grab some meat and potatoes. All right, so that's next week. Also, when we talk about Easter in a couple of weeks, we have today these little invite cards, all right? We printed these up this week. Um, just a real simple way to say, to, to pass out to people you know, someone you know you see, uh, have a talk with. Ethan, come up here for a second. Here's how it works. You have a card with you and you see a dude and he comes up and he says hi and I say, hey Ethan, man, you want to go to a cool church on Sunday? Yes, I do. And that's all you do. You give it to him and you walk away. Now he said, yes, I do because he's above average. If he would have said, no, actually I don't, you would say, well, just in case you change your mind. You give it to them and walk away, all right? You don't have to say any other words or be nervous. So these are in the back afterwards. Grab them. Uh, help people find their way to grace on Easter Sunday. Find your way right now to Hebrews chapter 4. If you have a Bible, open it. If you need to look it up online, let's do that. I want us to read it. I'll read it for you, our passage. Uh, we have sermon notes available online if that's helpful for you to follow along or to come back to later. Hebrews chapter 4, what I'd like to do uh, for this passage is ask all of you to stand with me. Uh, open your Bible, follow along. I will read for us. Let's read our passage. It's Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. As we've said, the book of Hebrews, the whole thing, is written to encourage you. So my hope and desire and prayer is that you Leave here encouraged each and every week because of God's word and what he's teaching us. And so when he's teaching us things, we want to listen and learn. Let me read our text for us, and then I'll ask God's blessing as we dive into it. Hebrews 4, verse 1, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse four, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Today, saying, through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not 
harden your hearts. Verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did this from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Let's pray. God, your word is holy. You have written it for us. You've written it to us. You've written, us, written it to us to understand you and to walk through the life you've prepared for us, the day today, the week ahead of us, to walk with you. And so, Lord, may we be encouraged from the teaching of your word. And honestly, Lord, there's some things in here that sound a little confusing. It's hard to keep track. But as we study it and understand it, Lord, we are so indebted to you for your kindness and your grace that you love each and every one of us. You have called us to yourself. You have put us in a place where we are loved and cared for. We walk because you are in us and with us. And Lord, you've also called us to a time and place that many people around us need to hear of this amazing good news. So Father, I pray your blessing on the words as we uh, dive into it for some study. We pray for our children downstairs and in the different rooms where they're being ministered to. Thank you so much for the many kids and the workers that are loving on them even right now. We ask this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, and had a seat. All right. Hebrews chapter 4. Today we're talking about rest. If you had, if someone said to you, look, you got the next 24 hours, it's yours, it's free. No problems. You get to go rest. What would you do? If you had 24 hours to go rest, what would you do? Would you rest? Would you start working on other things that need attention? Uh, you might be thinking, well, does that rest include my kids? Well, maybe. You know, it's okay. You love them. Whatever that is, if you had some time where it's like, I get to go rest. Right now, you're thinking of things that you would do, where you would go, how you would escape, how you would get rid of all the people around you. If we could just find some rest, we are a busy people. It's a busy culture. It's a busy time. A lot of work. A lot of things to do, a lot of catch up, a lot of people that need uh, a, a word from us, uh, a lot of people that need us to scroll their, their Instagram and make sure we say like and the right, you know, all this stuff is so demanding on us. We need rest. But the real picture here of what Christ is going to teach us through his word is the, is the ceasing of striving for perfection. To stop trying so hard to attain something that Christ has already done for us and to not, as followers of Christ, to not walk in this anxiousness, this unrest, this I'm never happy, I'm never satisfied, I'm never done, it's go, go, and I'm, I'm overwhelmed with it. As followers of Jesus, the word calls us to find a place of rest. Chances are it's not going to look or feel like a hammock under a palm tree on a deserted island. Chances are it's going to look like your week you just had. But walking through it with a sense of confidence of God's presence and his peace for us. In Hebrews chapter 4, that very first word we read is therefore. Some of you have been around long enough. You're thinking right now, oh no, man. Pastor Mark's going to go off for like 30 minutes explaining what therefore means. Well, I won't do that, but I might take five or three uh, because it matters. Uh, Tim brought, Brian and Tim did a great job through chapter 3 and when we were gone. And, and Tim, as he introduced Hebrews 3, 7, we're entering now uh, what, I, what I call one of the second of five arguments or what, what some people refer to as problem passages, these, these warnings, these teachings that the author gives us that causes people to say, what is he talking about? If you've ever read the Bible and walked away thinking, what is he talking about? You're in good company. Because sometimes we read stuff and it's like, what is going on here? And these five passages throughout the whole book are, are warnings. They're strong words to say, watch out, be careful, because as you remember, the whole book is about the Jewish Christians, people like you and I, people that knew Jesus, but they were Jewish. And they were feeling drawn back or tempted to return to the ways of Judaism, to the law, uh, to the rules. There was something comfortable about that as opposed to facing opposition and even uh, tribulation as followers. And so they were tempted. 
And so the writer is saying, guys, don't do that. You don't need to go back. Let me encourage you. And as I'm doing so, you need to watch out for a few things. Uh, so he said to watch out from, from, from drifting. We saw that in chapter 2, the first couple verses. Uh, neglect leads to drifting. So when you neglect the Bible, when you neglect time with the Lord, when you neglect those things of walking with God, pretty soon you start drifting. We looked at that a few weeks ago. As we drift from the word, we start to doubt the word. So if you don't pick it up, if you're not around, if you're not, if you're not listening, pretty soon a critic says something and you're like, yeah, maybe you're right. And we begin to doubt the things that we've been taught. We begin to doubt the very word of God. And then doubting the word leads to a hard heart where I don't trust it. I start, I have this rebellious spirit against it almost because I've drifted and I'm doubting. And now there's this sense of hardening that begins to take place. Perhaps you've gone through some of that or you've seen others. The author is warning the Jewish Christians to not do that. He referenced last uh, uh, of these warnings, uh, last, when Tim brought this up a couple weeks ago in, in chapter 3, verse number 12, he says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Who's he writing to, everybody? Say it with me. Yes, yeah, okay, that's good. To Christians. So he's not writing to people that aren't yet Christians. He's writing to the church. He's writing to us. He's writing to Jewish believers, those that know Jesus as Savior. And he's saying to them, uh, beware, take care, lest you begin to have this unbelieving heart. You've drifted, you've doubted, and now you have a hard heart that says, you know what, I'm not even sure anymore. He says, be careful of that. Throughout all of these passages, when he gives these warnings, these cautions, these strong words, he immediately gives us the answer. So here's what you want to do. And you see that in verse 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I'm telling you, Hebrews 3.13 is huge. It's a key verse for us. It ought to be a powerful passage for all of us. There are people around us that are struggling. You might be sitting on the same row with someone who's, got, who's starting to have some doubts. Something's kind of creeped in and they're questioning things. And by the way, it's not wrong to question things. But stay in God's word. Process through the teaching of scripture and through wise counsel and teachers. You might have people that are discouraged and the enemy is attacking and they're discouraged. And, and the Bible says, man, exhort one another. How often? Every day. Encourage each other. That's why we need each other. That's why we gather as a church. That's why we have small groups and, and various ministries. We need to encourage each other so that we don't begin to stray. Verse 14, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Those things we've been taught. The gospel, the truth of Christ's love for us, Christ in me. As we stay with that, we hold on to it. He says, as it is said, verse 15, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And that's where chapter 14 is going to, or 4 is going to help us. What is this rebellion? And Tim referenced it with the, with the nation of Israel. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt? led by Moses. So let's talk about us, me and you, today. 2023, right here in beautiful Flagstaff, uh, under 160-something inches of snow. Thank you, Lord. Um, where's the rest? There's rest for today. The idea of a confidence in Christ and a rest that says, yeah, life's hard, life's challenges, and, and I got this issue, and these things are, are tough, but there's a, comp there's a rest that we can walk in. There's rest for today. God made provision for us to enjoy real spiritual rest every day. And I so want that for you. And I want it for me. I want us to enjoy the fact that, yeah, no matter what's coming, there's a rest I have in the promises of Jesus, the presence of Christ, his powerful Holy Spirit with me. The issue is, oftentimes, it's the Christian good Christian people who struggle to understand what it means to enter into that rest. We think of rest as a day off. We think of rest as sitting out for a while. 
Uh, I need to stop volunteering because I need to rest. Or I've taken on too much, so I need to stop. I need to, I need to back up. Or we think of rest as stopping. That's not rest. It can be. I, I get that physically. But there's a rest that's deep within. That there's a confidence. Rest, as it's used here, means a present reality available for believers. A spiritual condition that affects our inner peace, joy, and hope. This is a place of rest that we see explained in chapter 4. The lexicon simply gives us to cease one's work or activity resulting in a period, a, a, a period of rest. We as followers of Jesus get to live in the rest of knowing Jesus. Not stopping and quitting and sitting off to the side, but having a confidence, a hope, a joy, a rest that says God's got this. We're going to see two rests referenced in our passage, and actually a third. Uh, the first you're going to understand is God's Sabbath rest. Uh, this idea that when he ceased from creation in Genesis 2-2, and we'll see that in just a moment, on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. Uh, Hebrews 4-4 references this. That's one rest. Another rest would be the rest, Israel's rest in Canaan. When Tim talked about the nation of Israel, you guys remember this. This is actually a big deal. So uh, they're, they're, under, uh, um, they're in Egypt, they're in prison, they're slaves. And so they're going to leave and go to the promised land, which is Canaan. And so to go to the promised land, uh, when we're going to celebrate Passover and talk about the Seder next Sunday as we get ready for Easter, this is all based on these stories in the Old Testament. When they left Egypt to go to Israel, they had a night called Passover night when God had judged the Egyptians. He was bringing judgment upon them, but he was giving a way out for those who would trust him. Beautiful, powerful story filled with symbolism, filled with great teaching of who Christ is and what he ultimately did on the cross. And that's all centered around the Passover meal or what we're going to see next week in the Seder. And so this Passover was intended to say, okay, we're out of Egypt, we're under God's blessing, let's go to the promised land. How many of you like to get where you're going when you head out going somewhere, right? If you're on vacation, if you're taking a trip, the goal is to get there. Just enjoy the journey thing? Where'd that come from? I'm teasing. Um, it's about getting there. And so the goal was that they would get there. But as you heard in chapter 3 a couple weeks ago, immediately there was a rebellion. They sent 12 spies to go check out the land. And as they checked it out, 10 came back and said, are you kidding me? There's giants over there. It's huge. They're going to kill us. They're going to swallow us alive. And so two, Joshua and Caleb, uh, said, let's do it. 10 said we couldn't. And so because of that act, because of that one response, the nation was under judgment. They would spend 40 years wandering around a place where they could have been there in like a week's time. They could have traveled from here to here in just a few days' time, but instead it took 40 years. Why? Because they didn't believe what God had promised them. That's the basis of what Hebrews is dealing with in these passages of chapter 3 and 4. And so the rest of getting to Canaan, the promised land, that's the other rest. We're going to get there. Let's, let's do this. The idea was it'd be quick. Instead, it took 40 years. But when we get there, it'll be, it'll be rest because that's what God promised. It's called the promised land. That'd be the second type of rest. The Sabbath rest is a picture of our rest in Christ through salvation, uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's an invitation. That's a call. That's a call to all who need rest. Come to Christ. Come to me, he says, and I will give you rest. Speaking of being saved. And then you have the, the promised land rest. And you know, if, if you're old enough to remember some of the good hymns of, of yesteryear, a lot of hymns kind of messed this up because they talked about we're going to cross the river and, and we're going to be in the promised land with Jesus in heaven. That's not what the, the picture of promised land is about in the Scripture. Uh, and, and in Scripture, the picture of going across this desert and entering the promised land is a picture of, of us being with Christ, like now. Because when they got to the promised land, what happened in Joshua? Anybody remember Joshua? It's a tough book. 
Joshua is all about wars. It's all about conquering the land. It's about living life. I'm in a place that God's called me, but it's not heaven. It's not all peaceful. It's hard. And so the promised land, that rest, is representative of us today. We live there. We're where God's put us. We live in a world that's not saying, yay, Jesus. And so there's conflict. There's trials. There's, there's some tough stuff that we deal with. Um, and so the the Sabbath rest is a picture of being with Christ. The Canaan rest is a picture of living with Christ. The inheritance we have with him. We'll see that in just a few minutes in our, in our passage. And the, and the third rest would be as referenced in Hebrews 4.9. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's when we get to heaven. Uh, Travis just led us in a wonderful song about that. The hymn of heaven. There will be a day. So here we are gathered as God's people and we're singing about there's going to be a day when this rest in Canaan and living the life of, of walking in this world will be over and we will be with him finally at rest as God is at rest from the seventh, on the seventh day. So those are the ideas of rest in this passage. Just a few thoughts for you. I have two main points for you this morning. Number one, rest is available. Rest is available. If you're worn out, if you're exhausted, if you're tired, whether it's spiritually or just in life, it's like, I just can't do this. Please know God gives us rest. Rest is available. Because of what it says in verse number one, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, this promise, it's not finished. What they led the nation to do by getting to Canaan was not the end game there's still more to go. Let us fear lest any of you should, uh, uh, should seem to have failed to reach it. It still stands because of what was said in chapter 3. So now you get to verse number 2. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. What does that mean? It means the ten spies had influence on the entire nation saying, guys, we can't do it. It's too much. They're too big. Christians today, you're born again. You came to a point in your life where you said, yes, I believe the gospel. Jesus is God. He died for my sin. He took my place. I believe it. I'm trusting in him for salvation. I've got that. I believe it. But are you kidding me? Living this out at work? Have you seen my work? Have you seen my family? They're antagonistic against everything I believe. This is the part that I struggle with. God, heaven, I'm okay with that. But it's the stuff right now. It's like the people at school, and they're, they're always harassing us. And honestly, the culture at large just isn't real fans of, of what we call Christianity today. And so we kind of have this uphill battle. And that's what he's speaking of here. Uh, it came to them. They heard, guys, into the land, it's yours. They heard that, but they didn't have the faith to believe it. They were not united by faith with those who had listened. There are people today that believe the gospel, but they're not living it out because they struggle. They're not understanding what Christ has invited us into. For we who have believed enter that rest. That's what he's saying. Christians, we know the rest of knowing Christ. We can be at peace with who he is. As the Israelites heard God's instructions and promise of a new land, so today we too have heard the good news that brings salvation, the teaching of Scripture. You remember Colossians 1.27, Christ in you changes everything. We have Christ with us. We live in a world that, yeah, life's hard. But no, that Jesus has promised us his very presence. Uh, he, he said they, didn't, they won't enter the rest because of their rebellion. We know that we can walk with Christ, but we also know life can be challenging. Many of you are living in the midst of that challenge. God's rest is still available. What he quotes in verse number three, as I swore in my wrath, they shall enter my rest. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? comes out of Psalm 95. If you'll notice in your reference there, in the, if you have a marking in your Bible, it'll point you to Psalm 95, verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We are God's people. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers, those, that nation, put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work for 40 years, God says, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they will not enter my rest. This is hard. This is hard to hear that God had a people. They're his. 
They, they belong to him. And they said no to God. And God said, man, I'm just really struggling with this, you guys. Because I gave it to you. It's yours. And they rebelled against him. And spent so 40 years, that generation, and Tim brought this out in chapter 3, that generation died in the wilderness. Only people 20, I think 20 years and, and below, as they grew, that 20-year-old is now 60, they are the ones that entered the promised land. They were judged because of their disbelief. So in verse 4, Hebrews 4, For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and as you know, this comes out of Genesis 2, 2. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall enter my rest, again referring to Psalm 95, 11. Since therefore it remains for some to enter. This is what I want you, Grace Community, to hear today. It remains. This is not Old Testament history that we're digging up trying to see what happened. We're realizing that the rest that God promised is still available. Um, It remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of what? Disobedience. God calls you and I to obedience. He calls us to a life that says, God, I hear you and I will trust you. I will follow you. I'm not just on my own, doing my own thing, and when I'm hurting, I'll come back to you. But Lord, I'm walking with you, I'm listening to you. God calls us to a life of obedience. They disobeyed God, which tells me, listen, God's people have the capacity to disobey and rebel. I think you know that. (laughs) We have the capacity to disobey God. We as Christians have the capacity to rebel against the goodness and the grace of God. Does it change our relationship? Only in as much as when your child rebels against you, eh, it's a little rough. It doesn't change the relationship. I praise God, and I hope you do too, that every time you rebelled against your parents, they didn't kick you to the curb and say, be gone, I don't even know you anymore. Now, in extreme cases, I think things like that might happen. But for most of us, you went through a a tumultuous time. You went through a time of rebellion. You thought, you know, I can do this better. My parents don't know anything. And you rebel. You disobey. But you're always their child. We're God's children. That's the beautiful work of grace. Even when when we rebel. These were God's people. They rebelled. I'm glad to know that my own father didn't kick me out of the house if I disobeyed him. When we come to Christ, we find salvation. We're born again. We're his. As I mentioned, come to me, Jesus said, all who labor and are heavy laden. That's the message of the church. We look to Flagstaff and beyond, all the way to Nicaragua and Malawi. We look around the world and say, Jesus says, come to me, you guys that are worn out. You're trying to find God on your terms. You're trying to please God some way. Come, Jesus says. You're worn out. Bring your burdens, bring your heavy laden. I will give you rest. There is rest in salvation with Christ. We can be at peace. I don't have to outlive anybody. I don't have to impress. I just simply trust that Jesus took my place on a cross. That's the message of this church, and that's the message of the gospel. And that's why, frankly, we get excited about opportunities to share it. This rest speaks of salvation, knowing God, peace with God. When we yield our very life, and if you've been in some of our studies, we use the word sanctification, this idea of every day I live this out, not to please God so he'll let me into heaven. I'm going to heaven for one reason. Everybody say the word cross. I'm going to heaven because he did the work. He did the heavy lifting. I don't go to heaven because I stayed faithful and I really did great stuff and and man, I I knew what rest was and I was great at it. No, I get to heaven because Jesus took my place. That's so important. But now I live it out every day. We we do this. We come to church. We fellowship. We we bless one another. We serve one another. We obey the scriptures. We study the scriptures. When I yield my life, I'm living for him. I'm learning of him. I'm submitting myself to him. This is what Matthew 11, 29 references. Take my yoke, this, this burden, this working together. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I, Jesus says, am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. I think that's the second kind of rest. 
The first one is I get to know God. I have peace with God. I get to go to heaven when this thing's over. But that second rest is I'm living the life of a follower of Jesus in Flagstaff in 2023. And frankly, it's a little rough on some days. Jesus says, share your burdens with me. Let's, let's take that yoke, that thing that puts the two oxen and lets them work together. Bring that over to me. I got you. You can find rest and confidence because I am God and I've got you. And I know where this is going. Trust me, lean on me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Verse seven, again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David so long afterward, and the words already quoted, if you hear his voice, do not harden. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would, not, God would not have spoken of another day. If the idea was only to get to Canaan, the whole point of the whole story was, let's get this nation over to what we call Israel today. Let's get them in the land. If that was the only goal, then we wouldn't be talking about this today. But that wasn't the only goal. That was the type. That was the picture. And it's still true today. God has a people, and those people have a home. And God called them to this place. That's part of their identity it helped, it helped define who they were. He says, if that was the only thing, God would not have spoken of another day. What do you think we're talking about when we say another day? This thing's not over. This thing's not over. We sang about it. There will be a day when all this stuff is over and I will stand face to face with Jesus. There will be a day. Gang, I hate to bring it up to you, but there's gonna be a day when there's a funeral and you're the star of the show. And they're all here to talk about you and remember you. There's going to be a day when, when we leave this and we're going to stand face to face with the God who made us. We don't spend a lot of time dwelling on that, but that's a reality. And so when I stand face to face, I will be at rest. I will cease from the labors of living the sanctified life. And now I will be glorified. I will be with Christ for all of eternity. So it wasn't just for the Israelites on their way to Canaan. It's still available today. Number two, rest is attainable. It's attainable. It's for you. It's for me. We can, get, we can have it. We can know it. You can leave this room in the rest of what Christ has given you as a follower of Christ. Because of what he said in verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day. That's what we reference in chapter 3. Now we know that rest is still attainable. It wasn't just for back then. It's for us. It's available and now it's attainable. So then, verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. This is the opportunity for us to cease from our labors, to quit working to impress others. We find peace with God. Those things that bring us anxiety. You're in good company, you're not alone. A lot of us struggle. There's things, that, the to-do list. I, I've got to do all this stuff. And, and, and then we forget, like, wait a second, Lord, you're the one calling me to this. You remember the story of, of Peter getting out of the boat and walking on water to see Jesus. What a fabulous story. He says, can I come? And Jesus says, come here, I got you. And, and he starts to walk there and, and he hears the wind or something and, and pretty soon he begins to sink. He was losing the rest. Hey, this isn't so easy after all. And the simple story is when he had his eyes fixed on Jesus, obeying the call to come, it was working. He's walking on water. When he began to be overwhelmed by the wind and the sound and the waves, he began to look down and he, of course, began to sink. And Jesus, in fact, was there to save him. We have rest available to us. We surrender our worries. What are those things that make you anxious? What's that stuff right now in your life that you're just like overwhelmed with? Matter of fact, you haven't quit thinking about it since you've been sitting here. Financial stuff, the workload, the relationship, someone sideways with you, whatever it is. Lord, I'm just, I, I'm struggling. You get to a certain age and those things all happen at two o'clock in the morning, you know? Um, everything plays here, like you got this super detailed thing that plays in your mind. You know, what are those things that worry us? What are those things? Can we bring them to God? He doesn't erase them, but he takes them. And I can walk in the rest of knowing, you know what, God's got this. Still gotta make some decisions. Still gotta do the hard work. But I've been encouraged by my brothers and sisters I'm encouraged in the word. I'm encouraged in the teaching. We surrender our worries. Surrender your anxieties. That's why at Grace we like to say the phrase we're word driven. To take God at his word means we got to know his word. 
What does God's word say about that, ang- that anxiety you have? What does God's word say about that thing that's kind of, you're feeling like I'm failing, I'm dropping the ball, and I'm going to be in a lot of trouble? What is that thing? God's word helps us. We have to know his word. So this rest, the peace of Christ, is possible because of his grace. The very grace of God that calls us to salvation and to know the cross is for us and to have an eternity where we'll be with him. That same grace walks with us today and takes and gives us that rest. In 2 Peter 1, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. It's all because of grace that we get to live this out and kind of work through it. And we have each other to work it through. Now in verse 10, he says, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. What happened on the seventh day? God creates the world in six. Day number seven, God rests. And we have the Sabbath rest, which is where the Jewish people take the seventh day, Saturday, and call it Sabbath, Shabbat. And they stop. They don't do certain works. They don't do any works. They have some rules they live by. We take that and we say, on, because Christ rose from the dead, on Sunday morning we gather to praise him. We still need to have days of rest. Please know that. It may not be legal, it may not be something that you're told to do that you have to, but we need to find rest in our life, in our busyness. Please take time to rest. Talk about it as a couple, as a family. We need to stop. We need to take some time off. We need to to slow things down. I realize some of you, there's so much going on, it's hard to say I've got 24 hours of nothing. I get that. Make some time of rest. You've got to slow down. Pay attention to your, your, your body. Listen to wise counsel. We need to rest. This rest, I think, is speaking of when God rested from his works, so we too get to rest from our works. He will call us home. We will be with him. We will understand. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul says, For it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves is a gift of God, not by works. This isn't on you. This isn't on you to out out impress and and do all these things for the Lord. He saves us by his grace. It's not of work so that we wouldn't boast. Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. God is doing his work in us. I think this is the secret, the lost secret of Christianity. Along with seeking to do things for God, we're also encouraged to expect God to be at work through us. It's the key to the apostles' labors. I can do everything through him who strengthens me. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. This is a new identity. This is where we find our rest. Let us, therefore, verse 11, strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Here's Paul. Here's Paul. Whoever wrote this, maybe Paul, here's the teaching of Hebrews. We need to look out for each other because some people around us are struggling with, can I stay at this? I know God loves me. I I think I'm excited about heaven, but I'm just struggling with today and tomorrow and this week and my family and this job and this pressure. We need to encourage one another with the truth of scripture. Enter into that rest. That rest means you walk through the trials, you listen to God's counsel, you trust his spirit, you get wise counsel among you, and you keep walking with God Looking to Jesus, as it says in Hebrews 12 to, uh, 12 to the author and finisher of our faith. Keep your eyes on him. God's got this. Look to him. Bring the worries. Bring the anxieties. Bring the stuff that feels overwhelming. Bring it before him. God rested from his work on the original Sabbath of Genesis 2 because the work was finished. We cease from self-justifying works because Jesus finished the work on the cross. So that's why we can find rest, even today with the stuff we're dealing with. So let us strive, as it says in verse 11, and I encourage you, faith in Jesus is not passive. Faith in Christ isn't, hey, I made a decision to follow Christ at VBS or when I was a kid or at camp or last year, so it's passive. I'm just kind of doing my life. No, faith in Jesus is active. Walking with Christ, trusting in him for the things he's brought my way. Believe God and enjoy the fellowship of peace we have with Christ and with each other. So here's some ways to apply this. Uh, Number one, know that you have God's promise of rest as his child. 
No, believe it. I have rest with Christ because of what he's done for me. Do you know Christ is your savior? Do you know he died for you? Have you entered that rest of knowing it's not, my, my getting to heaven isn't on me. It's all because of what he's already done for me. Know that you have God's promise of rest as his child. Number two, examine your week. Maybe even have the exercise of thinking of this last week. Any areas you have struggled not trusting Jesus? Have there been some things this last week where it's like, man, I totally didn't even think about God on that one. I thought I was on my own. Do you have some anxiety, some worries where maybe I haven't looked to Christ first? Is your heart showing signs of hardening because I've drifted and doubted? It's like, oh man, I forgot. God's got this. Number three, think through and discuss where you feel anxious. You're in good company. I don't know of anyone in this room that's like, I have no worries. You got worries. I know you do. We do. We live in this world. Think about and discuss where you feel anxious, where you're worried, feeling like you should be more in control. I'm losing control of stuff. I don't talk about it. Think about it. Like, Lord, what's that stuff you've brought in my life? I'm just like, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'm doing this right. And then find rest in God's presence within you and his work through you. God's grace saves us. God's grace keeps us right where he has us. And that's a sanctifying rest that we get to enjoy. There's some stuff coming. It's hard. Go through it. Just trust him. You're not in control. And we learn that time and time again. Lord, we trust you. Bring your anxieties before the Lord. Bring your troubles. Trust in him. Rest is God's gift for the believer. Let me pray for us. As we take these truths, think on them throughout the week, maybe discuss them. Father, you love us so much that you've given us an eternal rest. We know that because of what you did on the cross 2,000 years ago, you took my place on the cross. Because of that, there will be a day when I will stand before you. And I will rejoice and I will see loved ones and I will be with you. And God, I can't wait for that. But in the meantime, Lord, you have us right here. And there's, there's stuff that's just hard. There's things that are challenging, and sometimes we don't feel very rested. And Lord, help us not to spin out on trying to define how much rest we're supposed to have, but Lord, help us simply to come to you, to bring our anxieties, our worries, and to know, Lord, that you promise to always be with us because, because we have Christ with us. And God, you guide us in your spirit. You've changed everything about us. May we walk in that victoriously and joyfully. God, it, may the church encourage one another in these good works. We love you and thank you for the beautiful gift of Jesus, this grace that we've received. And now, Lord, would you receive our worship as we enter our week to praise you and live for you and to find that rest. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this out to him. Came from glory, took on flesh to save the lost, grace and mercy displayed upon the cross, our redemption. He's the hope for all mankind, one name over everything, one name over everything. Jesus over everything, He reigns forevermore. Our song for all eternity, Jesus Christ is Lord. Resurrected King in one moment, He brought death to its knees, all the power and all the authority to one name over everything, one name over everything, Jesus.
you for worshiping with us today. Don't forget to grab the invite cards and invite people to Easter service so they can hear the good news of Jesus. Thank you. Have a great week. God bless.